Hello folks and welcome back to War Tree Ironworks. Today I'm bringing you our second episode of Five Blacksmiths of History. But before we get to that, I would like to direct you to the subscribe button. I have noticed in our analytics that many of our views come from people who are not subscribed yet. So if you're watching this and you have not subscribed, go ahead and hit that pause button and click on the subscribe button and hit that notification bell like this video. We very much appreciate y'all watching our videos, and we appreciate it even more if you subscribe. All right, let's get this countdown started. At number five, we have Elizabeth Hager, born in 1750 or 55. Elizabeth Betsy Hager was an American blacksmith and farmhand. She worked in a smithy under the employ of a man named Samuel Leverett. In the beginnings of the American Revolution, Betsy worked to prepare weapons to be used in the war. In April of 1775, after the first battles of the Revolutionary War in Lexington and Concord, Betsy had discovered cannons that were left behind by the British. Promptly, the cannons were taken to the smithy she worked at and refurbished to be used by American soldiers. During this time, Hager fixed firearms and prepped ammunition and had also been known to be an expert in herbal medicine. And so, she would tend to the wounded and the ill. In 1787, she married a man by the name of John Pratt on the 22nd of July in Newton, Massachusetts. They went on to settle down in Pennsylvania shortly after the turn of the century. Elizabeth Betsy Hager lived a long life with her husband, and she passed away around the age of 90. There wasn't a whole lot of information that I could find on Elizabeth Hager, but she sure seems like she was an integral part of the American Revolution back in the day. If she had not been there... Who knows what would have happened? Who knows what the country might be like now? Moving on to number four. Pande Pira, a name that literally translates to blacksmith Pira. He was a native to the South Islands of the Philippines. Eventually, he relocated to Manila in 1508. Pande had built a foundry along the bank of the Pasig River, and then the Raja of Manila at the time had commissioned Pande Pira to cast cannons that would be mounted on the palisades surrounding the kingdom. But when Manila was captured by Castilian forces, the cannons were taken and presented as trophies to the first Spanish governor general of the Philippines. At this time, Pira would flee his foundry in Manila and relocate in a small town in Papanga, called Apolit, where he worked as a blacksmith forging farm tools and the like. Unfortunately for Pira, he was pulled back into Manila and made to work forging new cannons for the Spaniards. He again built a new foundry in what would be present-day Santa Ana, and was later, and once again, made to cast new cannons for the sixth governor general to be mounted on a new fortress by the name of Nustra Sonora de Gaia, which in English means Our Lady of Guidance. After many years of serving as a blacksmith for the Spaniards, Pande Pira died in 1576 at the age of 88. And that's it for number four. But could you just imagine being put in a situation where you're starting to live your life, starting a profession, and your land gets conquered, and you have to leave, then you're forced back by your enemies to make cannons for them. Pretty crazy. Let me know what you think down in the comment section below. So let's move on to our number three spot. But first... I would like to thank you all for joining us today for Five Blacksmiths of History, Episode 2. If you are enjoying it so far, please let me know what you think down in the comment section down below. Give this video a like, give it a share, and subscribe to our channel. We noticed that most of our views actually don't come from our subscribers. They come from people like you who are not subscribed. So if you are not subscribed and you watch our videos, hit that subscribe button. We greatly appreciate it. Now back to number three. Samuel Yellen, the American master smith and metal artist, was born in 1885 in Moiliv Podilsky, Ukraine, which at the time was part of the Russian Empire. Years after his birth, when Yellen was only 11 years old, in 1896, he began an apprenticeship with a master blacksmith, and he completed his apprenticeship in 1900 at the age of 16. Eventually, Samuel Yellen would leave the Ukraine in favor of traveling, and in 1905, he would land in the United States and go to Philadelphia, where his mother, sisters, and brother were also living. And very soon after making his home in Philadelphia, 
Samuel would go to the Pennsylvania Museum School of Industrial Art and begin taking classes. And very soon after that, he was even teaching his own classes. And he kept working there for the next 13 years, up until 1919. But it was during those years that Sam had actually opened his own smithy in 1909. And years later after that, after developing relationships with local clients, one of the most loyal clients he had, an architectural firm, Meller, Meigs & Howe, designed Yellen a whole new studio on Art Street in Philadelphia, where it is actually still running and in operation today. Sam Yellen passed away in 1940, leaving his blacksmithing legacy to his son Harvey Yellen, and after his death, Claire Yellen took over her grandfather's business and kept it going all the way to the present day. Before we get to number two, I would just like to thank Kurt Davis for his comment on our last video, dang, not even a mention of Samuel Yellen. Well, here you go, Kurt. I hope you enjoyed it, and thank you very much for watching. Next, at number two, we have Captain John Ames. He was an American patriot, a gunsmith, a revolutionary against the British. He is also an ancestor to one of the most famous families in the United States. Before the American Revolution, in 1773, Ames worked as a blacksmith, forging out nails, up until the British government outlawed nail mills in order to give iron manufacturers in Great Britain the monopoly on it. But despite this setback, Ames began making shovels, which were of great quality, so much so that it was said that he designed the perfect shovel. It was only a few years later that the War for Freedom began, and John Ames went on to make firearms for the Army of Massachusetts. And he also served in the Massachusetts Militia, which in 1776 was ordered to Newport, Rhode Island, to keep British forces from gaining a footing. John also served under two of George Washington's generals, one of them being the infamous Benedict Arnold. And in June of 1780, in Newport, they were sent to help a fleet of French ships in a number of attacks against the British. But after 24 days of waiting, the fleet never arrived. John Ames' final days of recorded service was in July of 1780, when the militia was sent back to Rhode Island to protect an army of 6,000 French soldiers. John Ames would make his way up to being a major, but despite this, he was referred to as captain for the rest of his life, as I had previously mentioned at the beginning of the segment. I guess it just had a ring to it. Ames died in Bridgewater, Massachusetts, July 17, 1805 in his 68th year, as it says on his tombstone. And that's it for number two. Captain John Ames, everybody. I think it was a pretty amazing dude. You know, certainly went through a lot of crap, did a lot of stuff, and, you know, even his family went on to carry that that crazy historical legacy. It must be quite amazing to have a family that historical. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments. And at number one, we have... Jan Livac. And I'm positive this is a man whose work everyone watching is familiar with, so long as you know anything about World War II. Jan Livac was born October 4th, 1898. He was a master blacksmith whose legacy stands as a reminder to this day. Livac was arrested on the 16th of October in 1939 in Bukowsko, Poland by German forces who had invaded on September 1st, 1939, just 16 days before the Soviets began their own occupation of the Polish country on September 17th, under a German-Soviet non-aggression pact. Livac was moved from prison to prison and finally being put into the German concentration camp in Auschwitz, June 20th of 1940. It was in the early days of the camp, so Jan was assigned the number 1010. Being a master smith, Livac was forced into one of the camp's commando, designing and forging the camp's infrastructural components such as handrails, grates, banisters, and many other pieces of ironworks that went into the camp. Not only once, but twice, in June 1942 and in March 1943, Livac was kept in solitary confinement in the 11th block. Now, the 11th block was a brick building that was part of the main camp in Auschwitz. For those unaware, this entire camp was a network of smaller camps used for the concentration and extermination of the Jewish people. 
There were over 40 death camps contained in this complex that was created and operated by the Third Reich. The 11th block, specifically, was also one of many buildings in the complex that was used to torture and exterminate prisoners. It had small chambers called Stetzels. These chambers were each one square meter with a 5 by 5 centimeter hole for air. Prisoners would be made to stand for 20 nights and also be forced to work during the day hours. It was also block 11 that the first uses of Zyklon B were housed to exterminate Jewish prisoners. On December 6th, Jan was transferred to Mauthausen Gusen concentration camp in northern Austria. He had been kept in the Melk and Ebenezer subcamps to dig tunnels for the Nazi SS. These tunnels were used to store munitions and weapons and whatever else the Nazis had decided to keep there. Probably a bunch of stolen stuff. Livac would be there for five more months, when finally on May 6th, 1944, the Abenzi concentration camp was liberated by the 80th Infantry Division of the United States Army Reserves. With his newfound freedom and a friend who was his cellmate in Auschwitz, Jan returned to Poland and found a new home in Bystrzyca Klodzka, where he set up as an artisan blacksmith up until he eventually retired. He passed away in 1980. Livac is known for being the prisoner who created what is now a monument standing at what used to be the main entrance for Auschwitz concentration camp that simply reads Arbeit macht frei as an act of defiance against the evil Nazis he placed the B in the first word upside down and that's it for episode 2 you know it's pretty crazy what Jan went through what he saw, what he was made to do forging components for a death camp and maybe or maybe not even having a clue what that place was going to be used for. Either way, all I can think is it must have been horrifying and I'm glad he uh, is one of the lucky ones that survived. Let me know what you think down in the comment section down below and thank you all for watching episode 2. Y'all have a good one and stay tuned for the next video. Oh God. <laughs>